some days you just wear too many hats. <laughs> anyway, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Is that the first scripture you have, Jim? Yes. Okay, because I forgot to put my text in then. <laughs> That's okay. We're in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. And when everybody finds their page, if they would stand. <coughs> and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of his thoughts, of the thoughts of his heart, was only evil continually. And he repented that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Pastor, would you pray? Father, we're just thankful for your word this morning. We're thankful for Sister Lee that has committed her life to you, Lord, and you've called her to preach. And I just pray this morning that you'd be with her as she brings forth your word and help us, each and every one, to listen carefully at your word as she brings it forth. We just feel that, Lord, she has receive this from you, and it's going to be a blessing to each and every one of us as we apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. God was upset that the people that he had created were so evil. It sorrowed him so much that he <coughs> repented of creating them. He was deeply sorrowful and wanted to change his mind about having humans. Except Noah found grace. But you know, grace isn't, the, this isn't the first incidence of grace in the Bible. Grace has been happening ever since God created the heavens and the earth. And salvation didn't begin with Noah and his family in the ark. It has been with us from the very time the first sin was committed in the garden, and it will remain with us through eternity. So this morning we're going to talk about the four different instances of how grace was delivered by God and what that means for us. The first one is in Genesis chapter 3, and this is a long one, so, but I am going to read it. And I've got the NIV for this passage, verses chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat, from the trees in the, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it, or you will die. Well, death hadn't entered the world before, but God told them if they touched, if they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, that they would die. But they didn't really know what that meant. But death is total separation from God. You will not die, the serpent said. Satan's calling God a liar. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. That must have been a lot of fig leaves. Fig leaves are little. 
and, and they didn't have needles back then like we have. So a stick with some vine? I don't know. But that would have been a job. I have been a seamstress. That is not an easy job, but with their technology, it would have been a lot harder. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of, of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree and I ate it. And here comes passing the buck. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? Well, the serpent deceived me, so I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all of your days. It sounds to me like snakes had feet before. That sounds like so. But now they don't. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. And he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe, and painful labor you will give, with painful labor you will give birth to children. I don't like this translation, because hard work, Yes, but not always severe pain. Mm -hmm. I have known people who didn't have any labor pains. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground since you were taken from it. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. And Adam called his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and clothed, clothed them. Now I know this is a story we all know, and know well. Eve was deceived by Satan, who appeared as a serpent in the garden. Adam and Eve, through their disobedience, learned of their nakedness and were ashamed. They didn't know they were naked, and they didn't know shame before this incident. So they made clothing from fig leaves. And like I said, that would be a lot of fig leaves, for they're very small in comparison to a human body. God knew of their sin even before he walked in the garden. But when he came down to meet with them, and, dis and they discovered that he knew, he punished them for it. Before he sent them packing from the garden, he, he gave them a promise of his salvation. And he covered them in his grace when he clothed them with the skins of the first animals sacrificed for that purpose. There was no animal sacrifices before this. No one knew what sin was. I, I, I say 15, 20 minutes tops in the garden before they did this, but you know, we don't know because God didn't tell us. But when God told them of their mistakes, he gave them a promise of salvation and he covered them in that graceful promise as he covered them with those animal skins. Adam taught these lessons to his children, the lessons of God's great love and his plan of salvation to come. I believe he also taught them how best to honor and serve God and what to bring to him as a proper offering, a sacrifice of a broken and contrite heart and a humble nature. 
I believe we see these lessons learned in the offerings given by his sons, Cain and Abel. Cain came with an offering from his crops, but his heart wasn't in it, so he gave his gift in rebellion. But Abel gave a gift of love, the best that he had among his flocks. Therefore, Abel's gift was accepted, and Cain's was not. And God sent Cain into exile to the east. And you know, there's a lot to be said about listening to the lessons our parents teach us and, and taking them to heart. Abel listened and received God's grace through the lessons he learned. Cain listened and rejected and received exile from God. He died before he was even dead because he rejected God and his plan. So this is the first grace in the Bible. The next one we're going to talk about is Noah and the ark. And we're going to go to Genesis 6, verses 1 to 6. And this is from the King James. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of earth, the, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them as wives, all of which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man, for, he, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty. God gave them a hundred and twenty years to get from the time of his decision here, to get it right. But they did not. And you know, I know there were preachers. Noah was one. But they didn't listen. And there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of his thoughts of his hearts was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. You know when a family grieves over a lost loved one, how that deep sorrow just gives you gut-wrenching sobs. I believe this is what God was feeling when he said this, that it grieved him in his heart. You know, it makes mentions here of the sons of God taking the, the daughters of men. And I know we've all heard the, the theory that these were angels come to earth that took men. <coughs> but I read in my, the commentary of my daily Bible a different account of what that might have taken place. And it says, in the accounts of Seth, Cain, and their descendants, there is a hint that two very distinct groups of people have been developing. Those descending from Seth, Enoch, for example, were apparently people who lived righteous lives before God. On the other hand, those descending from Cain, as typified by Lamech the murderer, appear to have degenerated into unrighteousness. Therefore, although there might be, there might be found individual exceptions within these two families, it can be generally assumed that the Sethites were godly people and the Cainites ungodly. <coughs> At this point, however, the, the record seems to indicate that the sons of God, perhaps referring to the Sethites, or in any event to those who have God-fearing heritage, now begin to intermarry with the daughters of men, not because they are righteous, but only because they were physically attractive. Sounds a lot like what we do today. <laughs> So, the sons of God married the daughters of men. And the apparent result is that a mixture of the ungodly and the godly leads to an obliteration of moral distinctions and righteous living. Amazing, huh? I like that description a lot better than the angels came to earth. 
But we read in our text that although God is grieved, sick at heart, over the evil hearts and minds of mankind, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah lived a life of true righteousness before God. So God gave him and his family, eight souls in all, a plan of salvation from the annihilation of mankind and the destruction of the earth. He told Noah to build a boat. Now, I, I, I assume that there may have been little boats in the river that they went fishing in and like that, but we don't hear of those. This is the first boat we hear mention of in history. Noah built a huge boat, bigger than a football field. And he waited for God to send him all the animals that he wanted to save. And then God shed him and his sons and, sons and their wives, <coughs> four men, four women, and all these animals, boy, what a zoo, <laughs> up into the boat. And there was there was never such a large boat constructed before. So you know his neighbors had to laugh. They were ridiculing and jeering. A boat that big? We've never even seen rain. You mean there's going to be a flood? What's a flood? I can hear it, you know? It reminds me of the old Bill Cosby skit that he did. Noah, build the ark. What's an ark? We're going to have a flood. What's a flood? You know? No. It, it, it leads to great humor. But it also leads to a plan of escape. Could more people have entered Noah's ship of grace? Absolutely. Had they repented and given up their evil ways, changed their <coughs> hearts and minds toward God? Yeah, it could have been a much fuller boat. But they did not. They refused. And I know Noah spoke to them the words of the Lord. And he prayed that all would seek God's salvation. But they refused. But God saved eight souls. In, and all the animals that could reproduce and fill the earth again. In that boat. God gave them grace from the floodwaters and the destruction of the earth inside that boat. And when it landed on top of the mountain, they built homes out of the wood, or at least we assume they did. They built homes, they grew gardens, they planted vineyards. So you know they must have taken some plant seedlings and whatnot in the boat too, as well as the food for the animals and all of those animals. There was a lot of stuff in that boat. And they rebuilt the earth with eight people. From Genesis 6, we're going to travel to the Exodus. And we're going to go to, verse, to chapter 14. But we're not going to read it. I'm just going to summarize. Because we all know the story of the Exodus of the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. <coughs> so for sake of time, we won't read the whole chapter. But Genesis 14 tells us how God made a path through the sea and that the Israelites walked across on dry ground. Amazing. God blew a strong wind, divided the ocean in, in two, and they walked across on dry land. The, Israel, the Israelites made it safely to the other side, and the Egyptians started out after them. And the water decided to fall back on top of them. Well, God let it go. Because God's hands were doing this. And then God said, okay, we're done. Amazing. And all of those Egyptians died in that sea. But God saved the Israelites from it. God gave them grace. As they prepared for their great escape, God gave them specific instructions of what to eat, what to pack, who to, who to go borrow stuff from that they weren't going to return. You know, God gave them favor in the eyes of these people who had ruled over them for 400 years. They left that country rich. They entered. 
they entered in at a time of famine, and when they left, they had a time of joy. They escaped the, the disaster that befell Egypt. Not only did God kill the Egyptian army and the Pharaoh in the sea, but God killed all the firstborn to make a point because Pharaoh said he was going to kill Moses' firstborn. Well, God said, uh-uh, Moses is my man, so we're going to kill your firstborn and all the firstborn in Egypt. But in all of this time of planning their escape, God was teaching them the lessons of the Messiah to come. The, the Passover meal, the whole ritual leading up to the dinner was the coming of our Lord. <coughs> How awesome that God used these simple lessons that he taught his children hundreds of years before the fact, the way of escape for all mankind. God gave the Israelites grace when he released them from their bondage in Egypt. God's final gift of grace was Jesus. Luke tells us of his birth in chapter 2 of the promised Messiah. <coughs> How Mary went with her husband to be Joseph to Bethlehem to register for the census and pay the taxes Caesar had decreed. His birth was the beginning of the fulfillment of God's promised grace. Grace came for all men and women about 33 years later, when during the Passover celebration in Jerusalem, he was sacrificed on the cross for the sins of mankind was buried and spent three days and three nights in the tomb and was gloriously resurrected at the end of it. We're going to read from Matthew chapter 27 verses 45 to 54. I have it from the NIV. That one's not in there, Jim? No. Okay, no, no problem. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. From about three in the afternoon, or at about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For a moment in time, God turned his back on his son. <coughs> but, he, when he did so, it was for our benefit. Standing there among, when some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling for Elijah. <coughs> Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge and filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah does come to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Jesus actually decided the time of his death. At that moment, at the moment that Jesus breathed his last, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Now that says that no man could have done that. If it ripped from the bottom to the top, a man could have made a cut and, and shredded it. But a man didn't do this. God did. The tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. And they came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake, and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. <clears throat> At that very moment that Jesus gave up his life, God's hand caused the curtain in the temple that separated the holy place from the rest of the temple to be torn in two. God just yanked it apart to give us access 
to what no man but a priest could access before. God let us right into the Holy of Holies. That is grace. This taking down of the barrier allowed righteous men and women direct access to God without having to go through priests and their rituals as written in the law. God's grace, the salvation given us by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection made a way for us to enter in. Now we've seen grace through many different generations through the history of mankind. Though we've only looked at four different views of it, we know that grace still abides today. In every instance of God giving his grace, though it may have seemed a corporate giving, it still had to be an individual receiving and accepting. If Adam and Eve had not each accepted the covering of grace that God gave them when he handed them the skins that he had the, the skins of the animals he had sacrificed. That person, that man or that woman, Adam or Eve, if they had not accepted, they would have remained in an ungracious state. They would have remained naked, ashamed, and afraid. But each accepted and received God's grace. If each person in Noah's family had not accepted God's word at face value and received his grace by dwelling within his ark, they would have died in the flood. Each member of that family had to receive their own piece of God's grace. Amen. Each man and each woman of the children of Israel that left Egypt after 400 years of bondage, had to believe Moses' word and accept that it was God telling them what to do as they escaped the Egyptians. Or they would have been stuck in the mud there with the Egyptians in that dry seabed. <coughs> it is the same today. We each one have to receive the grace, the salvation of our Lord on an individual basis. God has no grandchildren, no stepchildren, no other type of generational relation. He only has sons and daughters. Therefore, each person must make up their own mind to accept or reject God's grace by believing and receiving Jesus as their Lord and Savior. By the way, if you think that not making a choice is going to get you by, not making a choice for Jesus is making a choice against him. Amen. You have to choose to serve him. You have to consciously say, I surrender, Lord. It's all up to you. I will do what you want. Or else you have not received and will not receive God's grace. This gift of grace sets us free from sin. And we become servants of God Most High. In fact, the NIV says in Romans 6, 22 and 23, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is <coughs> eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Awesome. We can choose to serve and reap life, or we can choose not to serve and be dead, separated from God for all eternity. Romans 7, 4 through 6 says, so my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, 
so that you could be joined to one another, so that you could be joined to another, to the one who was raised from the dead, to bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful desires aroused by the law were active in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law because we have died to what controlled us so that we may serve in the new life of the spirit, not under the old written code. That's from the New English translation, that last passage. God has promised us life or death. If we choose life, if we choose to serve him, he gives us his grace. If we choose not, it is death. Pastor? I enjoyed that very much. I know that Lee has put a lot of thought and a lot of effort into her message this morning. And uh, it was very good. Thank you, Lee. Uh, there was a lot I could say this morning uh, about that, but I don't want to preach another message. <laughs> Especially the part about the angels coming down and, and uh, taking women that uh, uh, sometime, I'll ex maybe on a Wednesday night, will I'll explain where all that came from and, and uh, why it's incorrect. And it is absolutely incorrect. That, but I never heard the part you read that you That received. was in the commentary of my Daily Chronological Bible. Okay. And, and I loved it. That was the first time I read that and I just loved it. Yeah, I had, I had never heard that before. That's very interesting. And you know, I like to hear new things. I really do. I like to hear it expands our mind and our thinking, and and uh, we can entertain uh, different things, and we can grow in our knowledge and understanding of the word by listening to what other people has discovered and so forth. I heard of a a preacher one time that made the statement. He said, he said, I don't need to. Uh, uh, listen to anybody else. He said, I have the Holy Ghost to guide and lead me, and so forth. And there was an elderly minister there said, Brother, he said, that's, that, that's uh, all good and well and good, but remember that there's other men that's heard from the Holy Ghost also. So uh, we, uh, we want to hear from those that's heard from the Holy Ghost, don't we? Yeah. That's what we want to hear. So with that, let us stand this morning. <coughs> And uh, we're going to dismiss and have a bite to eat together and uh, have some good fellowship together. So I'm going to ask Joe if he will dismiss us this morning and bless our food. Thank you, Lord, for the great service. Bless the food we're about to partake of. Thank you. Amen.